Hi, Lakeview. Welcome back to the one and only Bob. Today, we're going to be reading um, more about George, Julia, and Bob's visit to the Wild World Zoological Park and Sanctuary, which they call the park, which is where Ivan and Ruby live. So when we read last, they had arrived at the park and there was a bad storm coming in and they were talking about a possible hurricane and things like that. So George told Julia that they could go visit um, Ivan and Ruby, but they had to stay close just in case. And um, Bob was talking all about how he can use his puppy dog eyes to get anyone to do anything that he wants. So he's going to continue to talk about that today. If you are following along in your own book, we are on page 88, and this little section is called Mr. Oog. Here's how I figure puppy eyes got their start. Cave humans were sitting around a fire, wearing mammoth fur, and grunting about how there was nothing on TV because TV hadn't been invented yet. And some wily wolf thought, whoa, they've got leftover mammoth meat. And he probably whimpered and cowered and did a tummy display and looked pathetic enough that Mr. Oog finally tossed him a bone. And soon enough, a few zillion years later, voila, man's best friend. After all that time, there's a thing, like a magnetic attraction between dogs and humans. We've studied them for so long, we can read every twitch and sigh. Suppose it was easier than chasing down mammoths. And I get it. I do. The behind the ear scratch, the food in a fancy bowl, the bed by the fireplace, Gotta admit that Julia's pretty fun to hang out with, and I'm grateful, really I am, that her family took me in. Still, I don't need them. You need someone, eventually, they let you down, and you end up feeling like a real doofus. The park. As Julia walks, I sneak peeks out of her backpack, like I always do. We pass the meerkat family poking out from their den holes like a whack-a-mole game they used to have at Max Mall. I see the flashy flamingos with their one-legged balancing act and the terrifying, beautiful tigers. Even their cute cubs give me the willies. Families, I've noticed, take a lot of different shapes. Jim and Joe, the penguins, adopted an abandoned egg, and they are the sweetest doting parents you ever saw. I see it with humans at the park, too. Families of all shapes and sizes and colors and genders, and yep, they all seem to do just fine. We round a corner past Sea Otter Alley. Oliver and Olivia are floating calmly on their backs, holding each other's paws. It's pretty adorable, I have to admit. But me, I don't need the trouble that comes with family. Babies puking, toddlers whining, spouses nagging. Talk about a design flaw. Change. The park's pretty big, lots of twisty paths and fascinating smells. All the parts have names. There's the African aviary, the outback, penguin cove, lemur land. It's like puzzle pieces of the world. A little Africa here, a little Asia there. Dogs, you can find us pretty much everywhere. Our territory is earth, as long as we're hooked up with humans, that is. Along with shady paths, oh, along the shady paths, volunteer guides will answer your questions. They'll tell you about how animals used to roam one part of the world or another until things changed. Things change. That's one thing I figured out. Don't ever assume a little patch of the planet belongs to you. Things change. Boxes go flying. My inner wolf. On our way, we always stop by the wolf habitat. Julia loves wolves, probably because they remind her of me. You have to look hard, maybe squint a little, but if you try, you can catch a hint of my inner wolf. It's in the eyes, mostly, also in my distinguished profile. I dream I'm a wolf sometimes, and when I wake up, I'm panting and my fur's on alert, and I'm feeling, yeah, the world could hurt me, but I could hurt the world right back even harder. Like there's a dangerous, hard part of me chained inside, struggling to get free and just, I don't know, get even. Then I go see what's for breakfast. Kimu. There's a gray wolf at the park who makes me a little jittery. Jittery as in I sometimes worry he might like to eat me. His name is Kimu, and we struck up a conversation with when a mutual acquaintance of ours, a mockingbird called Mitch, introduced us one day. Like Nutwit, Mitch likes to taunt me because I'm domesticated. Gives me a lot of grief about how free he is soaring stringless over the whole town. 
I'm not the only one who's pampered, I said one day. I mean, look at Kimu. He's not exactly running wild. As soon as the words were out of my mouth, I regretted them. And when I looked at Kimu's, I could kill you with one quick bite expression. I really regretted it. In any case, I said, moving the subject along, I've lived wild. It ain't a picnic for a dog. What was it like? Kimu asked. He moved closer to the edge of his domain. He had a strange odor, intense and scary and a little bit intoxicating. Well, I was just a pup, I said, abandoned by the side of the highway. Kimu was listening intently. Must have been tough. All I could think of was food, water. I didn't like the catch in my voice. Owl got me. Those guys are fierce, Kimu said. Can't hear them coming. I know, right? I relaxed a little. I hate owl, said Mitch. Hate them with a passion. They eat birds, you know. So do wolves, said Kimu, giving Mitch a meaningful look. So were you wild once? I asked Kimu. Never. Born and raised in captivity. Suzu over there, she was. She's told us stories that would curl your fur. Honestly, it's nice to have a roof over my head. It's tough out there, man. Really tough. I suppose, said Kimu. I looked at him and for the first time wondered if I really did have any wolf in me. He was a majestic animal with teeth that could shred a tree trunk. I am also majestic, but more portable, with teeth that could mangle a pencil with enough time and effort. Hey, Bob, Mitch said, do dogs howl the way wolves do? Of course we do. So let's hear something. A duet, maybe? He fluttered his wings, revealing startling patches of white. Do you know, talk to the animals? They play that on the carousel. Go away, Mitch, said Kimu, with just the right amount of menace in his voice. Come on, just a little howling. Pretend there's a moon. Pretend you're free. Pretend. Kimu growled, and so did I. His was pretty impressive, guttural, deep. It spoke of death and dismemberment and all kinds of unpleasant bird nightmares. I growled too. It spoke of me being mildly peeved. Still, Mitch got the message. He disappeared, a blur of wings. Actually, I've never howled at the moon, I admitted. Me either, said Kimu. I'd feel kind of silly doing it here. Enrichment. We're almost to my favorite spot in the park. The great thing for me is that one corner of Gorilla World just up. The great thing for me is that one corner of Gorilla World juts up against Elephant Odyssey, the area where Ruby lives. A low stone wall separates the two spaces, and there's a moat on the elephant side. The sections connect like two slices of pie, and my secret spot is right at the center, where I can hang out with my crew. Ivan and Ruby both have access to indoor habitats, which is great when the weather isn't cooperating. The indoor space for gorillas ain't bad. I call it the Gorilla Villa. It has tons of ropes and hammocks and branches to climb. Humans watch through a thick wall of glass while the young gorillas run around like kids at recess. But whenever Julia and I visit, we can almost always find Ivan and Ruby outside. We trudge up a little rise, though it isn't much of a hill. We live in a pretty flat part of the world. From there, I can see just about everything. The park, the parking lot, the creek, far beyond that. Every now and then, I can even catch a glimpse of the ocean. My secret place is a little hard to get to, right near the keeper's shed, nicely hidden by trees and bushes. Under a big magnolia tree, there's a bench shaped like a gorilla holding out his arms. Julia likes to sit there and draw. Sometimes she does her homework, which smells like frustration with a hint of a racer. Whenever I visit, Julia props me up on the stone wall that separates Ruby's world from Ivan's. Visitors can't see me, and the keepers pretend not to see me. If they caught any other dog there, he'd be out in a heartbeat. But Ivan and Ruby and I have a history. I make them happy. I'm what you might call enrichment. At the park, they try to keep the animals engaged with surprises and challenges and changes to their environment. That's what enrichment is all about. The gorillas get watermelons to demolish and boxes to hide in and markers for drawing. The elephants get sprinklers and flavored water and elephant-sized rubber balls. Not exactly like a day in the real jungle, of course, but the keepers try as hard as they can to make life interesting. For Ivan and Ruby, I'm the ultimate enrichment. I'm their best pal.
walls, and bad guys. Julia takes me out of her backpack and I settle onto the wide stone wall. It's my fave place in the planet because it means I can see Ivan and Ruby. But I also kind of hate it. Walls will do that to you. Ivan, being Ivan, is a mellow kind of guy. Takes the good with the bad, only gets angry when he really needs to. When I complain about the walls at the park, he says, Walls keep animals in, but they also keep bad guys out. Of course, gorillas don't have a whole lot of bad guys to deal with. Elephants either. So humans step in to fill the void. Dogs? Sometimes it feels like we have enemies galore. Everyone wants a piece of us. Humans treat us badly. Cars really have it in for us. We even get eaten by coyotes, which is kind of like having your cousin invite you over for dinner, then inform you that you're the main course. Although I'd probably just be an appetizer. Anyways, after those 27 years stuck in a mall, Ivan is one of those glass half full kind of guys when it comes to the walls surrounding him. Glad to be with others of his own kind, cared for by smart and loving humans. I'm more of a water bowl of power half empty kind of guy. Every time I leave Ivan and Ruby, I am painfully aware that I can leave. Ivan's address is Gorilla World. Ruby's is Elephant Odyssey. And me, I guess my address is the same as Julia and George and Sarah's. 1249 Hinman Avenue. I mean, of course it is. I've been living there a whole year now. It is. And yet sometimes I still wake up at night and think, gotta find shelter, gotta find safety, gotta find somewhere to belong. Guess I don't want to get too comfortable. Gift. Once I'm in my spot, I don't have to do a thing because Ivan and Ruby always know where I'm, always know when I'm there. Excuse me. Gorillas and elephants have great schnozzes too. Also, I pride myself on staying extra fragrant. It's a gift. Ivan. Ivan gets to me first. Bob! He knuckle walks up the hill. Knuckle runs, actually, and he looks as glad to see me as I am to see him. It's like, it seems like I've known Ivan forever, and yet every single time I see him, I feel kind of odd. He's so powerful so huge, like this magnificent silver mountain that just happens to be my best buddy. Hi, Ivan, Julia calls waving. He cocks his head and makes a soft belch, which is gorilla four. I'm happy. Maya calls out to Julia from the door to the gorilla's indoor space. Maya's a zoologist, which is a hoity-toity way of saying she has a thing for animals. It was Maya and lots of other good folks who helped get Ivan and the rest of the mall animals moved to better places. Julia unhooks my string and gives me a stern look. No funny business, you, she says, and then she kisses me on the head. And stay out of sight. Ivan sidles up as close to the stone wall as he can get. I was worried you wouldn't come by today, he says, weather and all. Another hurricane, I say. It's freaking everybody out. Above me, magnolia branches sway, leaves rustle and shiver. Every tree seems uneasy. What's new, Ivan asks. He lies back on the grass and wriggles contentedly, scratching an itch, no doubt. Not much. Had a weird dream last night. I pause. You were in it, and me, and Ruby, and Stella, too. Ivan gazes at the darkening sky. Stella, he says. Now there was a great friend. Classiest elephant you'll ever hope to meet. The best, I agree. I miss the old gal. We have fall silent. All good with you, I ask after a moment. No point in dwelling on sad stuff or bad dreams. Kenyani's getting on my nerves a bit. Ivan do this. Ivan do that. But she means well. Kenyani is Ivan's lady friend. Girlfriend? I've never been sure what they call it in Gorilla. Kenyani doesn't really approve of me. She thinks I'm a bad influence on Ivan. I like to think she's right. Ivan is 400 pounds of pure power. But Kenyani is 400 times scarier. Trust me. I've seen her in a bad mood. I've also seen her teeth. Make mine look like toothpicks. Ivan and Kenyani don't have kids, but there are a bunch of baby and juvenile gorillas hanging around. They call him Uncle Ivan, and he puts up with their antics. Ivan's always been a good sport. If I had a gorilla toddler hanging off me, I'd be tempted to use my toothpick teeth. 
And that's where we're going to stop for today. We will see you next time. Have a good night, Lakeview.